Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We always miss you when we're gone, and I said at the early service, it always feels like when I come back, I've been gone a lot longer than we were gone, but um, because I miss you. But it's good to see everybody here this morning on the Lord. So if you were here two weeks ago, we started a brand new sermon series on the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And it seemed to fall into place that as some of us go on some day-long trips during the summertime or maybe a a week-long vacation, we're on the road, that we would go on the road with the Apostle Paul during summertime. I've been ordained 18 years next month and, and been preaching pretty much every week for 15 of those, and I've never preached a sermon uh, or a series of sermons on the life of the Apostle Paul. I've preached many times from the 13 books that he wrote in the New Testament, but never have really preached about um, his life specifically. So this is not just new, maybe perhaps for some of you, but it's new for me as well. So we learned in that first sermon that when we first meet Paul, he is called Saul in the book of Acts because that was his Jewish name. It was customary at that time, especially for males, to have two names. So Saul was his Jewish name and Paul was his Roman name. And it's in chapter 13 that we see Saul being called Paul for the rest of um, the New Testament. That's when his ministry really expanded to um, go to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and not just the Jews. So it makes sense that that's when he would begin to use his Roman name and not just his Jewish name. So in his letter to the church um, in Galatia, he wrote this, and let's remember before I read it, that he prided himself on being the best of the best of the Pharisees. So let's read this. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So Saul saw the people who were followers of the way, who were followers of Jesus Christ, like a deadly virus wanting to kill Judaism. And so his goal was to kill them first, was to kill the church of Christ, to to, to kill um, anybody who was a follower of Jesus Christ, to imprison them and, and hopefully, in his mind, to take them to execution. And a couple of weeks ago, I compared him to Kim Kim Jong-un of North Korea, Um, about whom we have heard more in these last couple of weeks about the true treatment treatment of Otto Warmbier. And it's hard to imagine worse, quite frankly. Now, of course, North Korean leadership denies any torture of this young man um, whose crime was trying to steal a political banner for a souvenir before he left the country. But of course they deny it. But Saul... He didn't deny anything. He was proud of everything that he was doing. He would tell anybody what he was doing. He was proud of the work that he was doing, what he thought was for the kingdom of God. But then God broke through. You remember this? On the road to Damascus, God broke through. There was a flash of light. Saul fell on the ground. He had a vision of Jesus, and he ended up hearing words from Jesus that told him to go into Damascus, and there he would be told what to do. And he lost his sight. So he went, he was led into Damascus. In the meantime, this guy named Ananias in Damascus, who was a follower of Jesus, was told by the Holy Spirit to go and find Saul, lay his hands on Saul so that he might regain his sight. Saul had more than met his match in the hound of heaven. God pursued him, just like God pursues you and me. And from that day forward, Saul's life was completely given over to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So I want to go back and look at a scripture we looked at two weeks ago, make sure we're all still on the same page. This is what happened right after Ananias laid hands on him. For several days, he, meaning Saul, was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who have made havoc in Jerusalem among those who invoked his name? And has he not come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. After some time had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. 
but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night so that they might kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. So today we're going to spend our time between verses 22 and 23. We're going to spend our time between verses 22 and 23. So if we could put those two verses up there, please. We're going to spend our time in that black space between 22 and 23. Let's pray together. Thank you, precious Lord, for the gift of your word, the gift of your spirit, the gift of your pursuing love in our lives. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can see in verse 23, it begins, after some time had passed. Well, how much time? Was it a day or a week or a month or, or more? Well, in Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, we find part of the answer. Paul writes this to the church in Galatia, But when God, who had set me apart before I was born, called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal a son to me, so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles. I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me, but I I went away at once into Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. So between verses 22 and 23, Saul went to Arabia. So you can see I made some boxes over here just so you can get a sense for where he's going. He's in Damascus, and he's heading down to Arabia. It's not that far away. He went down to Arabia. I mean, he he was there. Um, Nobody knows exactly how long, maybe as long as three years. Now, why Arabia? Well, biblical scholar N.T. Wright, along with other biblical scholars, proposes that Saul went to Arabia because he had an identification with the prophet Elijah, the prophet Elijah that we read about in the Old Testament. Saul described himself as someone who was zealous for the law of God, and the prophet Elijah described himself as someone who was zealous for the law of God. So for us to understand this identification, I'd like for you to take out your pew Bibles, please, and we're going to turn to 1 Kings 19. It's page 254, if that'll help you. Those of you who are readers, open your pew Bibles, please, to page 254, 1 Kings 19. And we're going to start in verse 4, and we're going to go all the way down through verse 16. 254, if you need a page number. Okay? We're talking about Elijah now, okay? He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It's enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. And he looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and he ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. And then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous, there's that word, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, meaning the Lord, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah Elijah heard it, 
He wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. And then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. Also you shall anoint Yehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, as prophet in your place. Now, Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai were finished. You may look up now and put the Bibles down. (laughs) You're like, wait a minute, it doesn't say that. Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai are essentially the same mountain. And this is where Moses, folks, received the Ten Commandments. And this is where Elijah apparently heard this still small voice asking him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And this is where quite possibly Saul, who would have known the scriptures, of course, saw Elijah's zealousness turn from a a violent zealousness into a zealousness for more humble servanthood. Elijah, we learn in the chapter right before this one, he was responsible, responsible for the killing of all of the prophets of Baal because of his zealousness, and he thought he was protecting the holy law of God. And Saul, well, we know about him now. So did Saul head to Mount Sinai because of his identification with Elijah in this moment in his life? Remember what Elijah said? I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. I mean, there was no other Pharisee who would turn to faith in Jesus Christ like Saul did, and they were seeking his life. He, he must have felt like, like Elijah. He must have felt like that. And so if that is true, then Saul's time in Arabia was, was meant that he would go to listen to God, to talk to God in preparation for whatever it is that God had ahead of him. And this is important, folks. This was important for Saul, and this is important for you and for me. Because if we want to be prepared, and it doesn't matter how old you are, if you want to be prepared for the work that God has ahead for you, then we have got to spend time listening to God, talking with God, but let me put an emphasis on listening. To God. Because some of us are impatient. Amen? Mm. We want an answer from God. When we want to hear from God, we want to hear from Him now, right? I want to hear from you right now, God. And so we sit down and we say, okay, God, here I am, sock it to me. Nothing. So we sit down again, and we say, okay, God, in case you didn't hear me last time, maybe you were busy with somebody else, in case you didn't hear me last time, I'm here, and I'm sitting down, and I'm trying to be quiet. Come on, sock it to me. Nothing. And maybe it is that we're listening like Elijah was listening. We're trying to listen for God in the wind or the earthquake or the fire, or maybe we're expecting some flash of light and a vision of Jesus like Saul experienced, and we're not really tuned in to the sound of silence. Because a lot of us don't really like silence. I like silence. If you came to my house in the middle of the day, The TV isn't on, there's no music on, it's just quiet, and I love it. But if you come home and John's at home in the middle of the day, he's got music playing, so many, I can't even tell you how many times I have gone around the corner, he's in his office, the music is blaring, and I have scared the guy out of his chair because he hasn't heard me come in the door. He doesn't necessarily like silence. And some of us don't like silence, but I think none of us like silence when we're waiting to hear something from God, right? Nobody likes silence then. We want God to speak, and we want God to speak now, because I need to know what to do about my job, 
or about my finances or about my, my marriage or about my kids or about my retirement plans or just about my purpose as a disciple of Jesus Christ or about my coursework or about my boyfriend or my girlfriend or my friends or my health report or my this or my that. Okay, God, I'm ready. Tell me what to do. And God says so patiently, what are you doing here, Megan? I'm waiting on you, God. Really? Yes. Well, you don't seem to be waiting very well. You seem pretty demanding. Like you're trying to tell me what to do. Deep breath. I'm sorry, Lord. Saul went to Arabia for an unknown length of time, maybe up to three years. And he went to this place where he knew God had spoken in the past. He went to hear from God. He needed to hear from God. And he did hear from God. I mean, this is how he was able to say to the church in Galatia with, with complete confidence, with truthfulness, and we'll look back up at that screen. It's the part that's underlined. This is how he was able to say to the church, I did not confer with any human being. I didn't confer with any human being. I didn't go up to Jerusalem to talk to those other apostles. I just went away into Arabia, and then afterward, I returned to Damascus. So just, this is amazing. This is, this is Saul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 books of the New Testament. He got a crash course in discipleship directly from God, directly from God. And he needed that, I mean, because he had some zealous ways of being that needed to change. And he was used immediately by God in Damascus before he went to Arabia, but he needed that time in the shadow of Mount Sinai in order to bring his life fully into submission to the Lord. Because without that, knowing what he had ahead of him, I mean, we know the New Testament, he had sufferings, uh, persecutions and sufferings ahead of him. If he had not had that time alone with God, he might have cracked under the pressure and maybe done more harm than good to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think sometimes we see, we get so excited about people who have come to faith in Jesus Christ, new faith in Jesus Christ, that we end up putting them up front to tell their story before God has called them up front to tell their story. I read about this experience um, that my commentator had, um, Kent Hughes, and I'm just going to read this story from him, and I quote, he, he said, a number of years ago when I was a youth pastor, Word came to me from one of the large churches in my area that the last living member of the Bonnie and Clyde gang, Big Jim Harrington, had been giving his testimony to standing room only crowds with amazing results. So I made the arrangements for him to come and speak at our church. I arranged for special music, several thousand handbills were printed and distributed at the local high schools, and I enlisted counselors. The night arrived and it went beyond our expectations. There was a sea of teenagers and Big Jim was unbelievable. An imposing man about 80 years old with tattoos on the back of his hands and an indentation atop of his bald head from an old bullet wound. For two hours he regaled us with powerful stories of his wasted life with Clyde Barrow and he poignantly exhorted us not to waste our youth and urged us to commit our lives to Christ. And everybody was thrilled. The elders who had been reticent congratulated us on the service. I was so very satisfied and a little smug. Until two days later, I received a call from Big Jim's agent who told me that he had just learned that Big Jim was an imposter and that, in fact, he was a well-meaning alcoholic who lived his life with his daughter out in the desert, and he suffered delusions about his uneventful past. Gulp, he wrote. 
I learned a major lesson from that experience, he said. Indeed. We all need to bring our lives under submission to the Lord as Saul did. I mean, we need to get away from time to time and we need to listen to the Lord so that we aren't in a position where we think we need to pretend that we are somebody that we aren't. We need to get away with God. We need to get our Bibles open in front of us. And you might say, well, what do I open it to? Well, I don't know. Open it to Psalms, open it to the Gospel of John, open it to Genesis, open it to wherever you're led to open it to and read a couple lines and then say, Lord, help me here and I, and I need to hear from you. I need to hear from you, Lord. And then we gotta listen. We have to listen, we have to listen if we want to be prepared to do the work that God has for us. And trust me, every single one of us, no matter how young or old you are, every single one of us has work to do. Your work is not over if you're older. Every single one of us has work to do for the kingdom of God. So for the next three nights in an open door cathedral, up at Hammond's Grove, we're going to have the opportunity to gather together as brothers and sisters in the faith. Now, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand, but when you first heard the word revival, maybe a month, maybe six weeks ago, you're thinking, that's not for me. Because I think for many of us, we think that a revival is just for the lost people out there. And let's remember something. There's Approximately 85% of the people in this valley, Shade Valley, Burns Valley, uh, Amberson Valley, approximately 85% of, the, of our population in this rural community are unchurched folks. Meaning folks who, it's either unchurched or dechurched, a combination. Dechurched means people who have gone to church but haven't, haven't been back to church for a very long time. 85%. And I think we think, well, that's who the revival is for. Revival isn't for the church people. It's not for me. I mean, a revival implies something that needs to be revived. And I don't think that you can be spiritually revived if you weren't spiritually alive at one point. Anyway, so I think that means that a revival primarily maybe is for you and for me. It's for brothers and sisters in Christ. It's for the church of Jesus Christ, that the church needs revival. I need revival. You need revival. In our souls, we do. Because if all of us who said that we are followers of Jesus Christ, if we lived passionately for him, passionately for him, then our valleys would be different. Our valleys would be different. If we fully submitted our lives to Jesus Christ, if we did as Saul did and stopped living as if uh, being a Christian means just coming to church on a Sunday morning and that the way that we live, our, the way we get a life that's full of joy and peace and, and patience and the fruit of the Spirit is, you know, we j just get it like that. If we, if we live the kind of lives that Jesus wants us to live, our valleys would be different. Your home would be different. My home would be different. Our workplaces would would be different. Our schools would be different. And how about this? Our government would be different. It would. Our morals and our values and our, our sense of truth and our commitment to modesty in our dress and modesty and our actions, I believe, would be different. That there would be a true revival that would, that would change the direction of the lives of our children and maybe restore hope inside of each one of us. That maybe this world, this, including our own nation, is not going off in the wrong direction. Does that sound good to you or what? It starts with me. And it starts with you that we all have to recognize that we have not submitted every area of our life to the Lord. We have not. And if you think that you have, if you're sitting there thinking, well, yes, I have, well, then I'm telling you right now, you're being deceived. Every person is holding back areas of their lives from being submitted, fully submitted to the Lord. And that includes me. I am not your pastor because I'm perfect. I'm your pastor because God called me to be your pastor, but I need to submit my life to the Lord in ways just like you do. 
each night we're going to have a different pastor from our ministry leading from up front, and we have different people sharing their testimonies. We aren't bringing in big Jim Harrington or anybody like that. These are just regular people, including our own Marie Hill, who's going to share her testimony on Tuesday night. And she's worked hard on it, and it's a hard story to tell, but the theme of her story is God. The theme of her story is how God got her through and how God continues to get her through, continues to push her to be something better than she knows um, she has been in the past, just like all of us. Pastor Harold Yeager, who was at the Dry Run Church of the Brethren for many years, is going to offer the message. There's nothing fancy about what's going to happen. There's nothing slick about what we're going to do. There's we just believe as the pastors who are part of the ministerium that if we're faithful to do what we believe God called us to do, to offer revival for three nights in Path Valley at Hammond's Grove, that maybe, maybe when we get away for and with the Lord, that maybe we might hear the Lord saying to us, as he said to Elijah, what are you doing here? We might be able to get real with him and maybe real with each other. We might be able to hear from him in a way we can't hear when we're sitting in a pew here in our sanctuary. And so I'm challenging you to come and to bring a chair and to bring a friend and a neighbor, a coworker, a family member, so that we might hear from God, whatever God wants to say to us. And you know what? He knows what you need. He knows what I need. Before we ask, he knows what we need because he knows our sin and he knows our pride. He knows our sadness. He knows our grief. He knows our troubles from the first to the last. He knows the things that we struggle with. He knows those areas of our lives that, that we're withholding from him. And so I pray with the other ministers in our valley that God would bring revival to our hearts and our souls and our minds, that God would bring revival to our churches and of course, of course, of course, that God would bring the lost into the precious family of the found. We're not perfect, but we do serve a perfect Savior. Thanks be to God. Amen.